All right, everyone. Uh, this is Unit 7, Topics 5, 6, and 7, the last lecture of a gigantic course. I just want to tell you that I know you came into this class with some prior knowledge, but just stop and reflect on how much you've hopefully grown this past year. You've definitely picked up a lot of skills, even if there's some of them you're a little rusty on. The next time you see them in a college class, you'll kind of go, I've heard this before. This isn't a problem. I'm going to pick this right back up. So even if you're not taking the AP Bio test or you take it and you don't get the score you want, nobody can take away the experiences you've had in here and hopefully they'll um, uh, be useful to you as you move forward in your academic biology career, okay? Even if you never take another biology class in your life, stuff you've learned in here, hopefully it'll just make you a better thinker. The AP Bio test is one of the hardest AP tests out there, according to the experts. So we're gonna start getting ready for that after this lecture. Thanks for going on this journey with me. I've had a lot of fun this year, especially learning how to YouTube everything and throw it up here. All right, let's get started. So, just kind of reviewing stuff you've probably had earlier in your educational career, a community, okay? You look at that beautiful picture there, You've got a huge community. I see a rhino. I see some sort of gazelle or something. I see elephants. And of course, all these different types of plants. There's a mountain in the background to even show that, you know, maybe it's a little bit different biome up on top of the mountain. Okay? We call that a community. A community is a set of populations, both plant and animal, that are interacting. Okay? One thing eats another. One thing uh, uh, praise on another okay so not a big you know groundbreaking concept something you've probably heard a niche a niche okay I've been mentioning the word niche a lot throughout the year a niche is something in a habitat that is occupied by an organism and they often um, are ex exploited for energy or protection or, or some sort of anything that enhances that organism's survival. Okay? Um, going out into Nate, going out to the, the little land lab we did where we collected the insects. There's lots of different niches out there. You were looking for those uh, isopods under logs and leaf litter, that's a niche, okay? Breaking down that wood is a niche, okay? Staying in those moist spots is a niche. If it runs out of niches out there, it's gonna be hard to survive, or the niches change, okay? I think niches, I don't know, how, what's a plural? All right, so we're gonna break it down a little bit more than we have before, okay? There are fundamental niches, and realized niches okay so fundamental niches have the potential to be occupied by the species if there were no limiting factors okay if there were no competitors so underneath of logs there might not be roly-polies or isopods under every log but those are potential places they could live Okay, maybe we have to have some sort of, there, the salamanders that live out in, in the woods have to lay their eggs in some sort of pool, okay? There are only so many of those spots out there for them to lay their eggs, but they probably don't use them all. Excuse me. So niches can get really complex in complex environments. Okay. Um, 
as Michael Crichton liked to say in his Jurassic Park books, nature finds a way. All right. So there's lots of lots of potential spots in the environment that organisms can take advantage of. Things we probably overlook day to day. So realized niches are the ones they're really using. That's how I kind of think about that. All right. Now, there are lots of interspecific interactions. There's lots of inter there, okay? Um, this is when we have one species interacting with others. And this happens in a large number of ways, okay? Competition. Species can compete for all sorts of things. Now remember, this is multiple species. So if we're competing for mates, this is not interspecific. If we're competing for the watering hole, that's interspecific, okay? So we might compete for the number of seeds out there that can be eaten. Um, you might compete for uh, spots to build a nest, okay? You might compete for prey, okay? If hawks and snakes are both eating um, chipmunks, they're competing for them. Um, you might compete for the plants that can be eaten, okay? You might compete in, in your, um, if you're an herbivore. There's other ways that, inter that species interact that aren't necessarily like there's only so much who can get them You've probably heard of these relations. There's different symb symbiotic relationships we'll go over. And then there's facilitation, which is kind of a weird one you probably haven't heard of before. This is a list of what we're gonna go over. Let's see where it takes us. Okay. I want you to think of these relationships as sort of positives, negatives, or zeros. So if I say negative slash negative, this is negative for one species, negative for the other species, okay? So, there is this concept called competitive exclusion principles, okay? That means two species are going to compete for the same resource or resource set, and they, they can't coexist permanently. Now, if the niche area is big enough, zebras eat grass, gazelles eat grass, they can spread out enough to where they can do that. But any competitor that has a slight advantage will eventually eliminate inferior competitors in a limited resource situation. So even if I'm just slightly better at extracting the nutrition out of the environment and it's the same nutrition you need, I will eventually outcompete you. So that's a negative negative. You're taking away what I need, I'm taking away what you need. If we're different species. So competition. So what does this do, okay? If I can only eat, I don't know, let's say I'm only good at eating grass, but you're good at eating grass and tree leaves, okay? What it does is it drives things into niche partitioning. If I eat all the grass, you will shift over to the leaves and our niches will become partitioned or separate. But just remember, competition is negative, negative. It makes it harder for both of us 
because we have to spend energy competing rather than just, you know, I'm just going to use all of the niche that I want. Well, location and resource you are usually tightly integrated. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so they're kind of the same thing. All right, predation. This is a positive negative. If I eat you, that's good. If you are eaten, that is bad. Okay, this is very easy stuff, okay? Usually... Predators and prey co-evolve together, okay? Predators and prey co-evolve together. And that could be animal-animal or animal-plant. So a couple examples of adaptation of prey animals, okay? Camouflage, we call that cryptic coloring. Cryptic just means hidden. So, I mean, there's so many animals out there that are camouflaged. Some of them can even change their color. So this camouflage can get very, very complex. There's mimicry. There's multiple types of mimicry. There's Batesian mimicry. This is where a harmless species mimics a harmful one. Corn snake, there are flies that are black and yellow that make them look like bees. Um, this is, goes back to animal behavior where I learn black and yellow equal danger. I don't want to bother that thing. So anything that looks black and yellow, even if it's not poisonous, I'm going to kind of avoid that. I'm going to prey on something else, okay? Then there's Mueller and mimicry and species that have different common ancestors resemble each other and they still taste bad, they're poisonous, they're dangerous, whatever. So there are multiple sets of insects usually that have this, or even plants that have this, where they're both bad tasting. Uh, monarch butterflies are a good example of that. All right, so just a couple adaptations. There's way more than this, but these are predator prey, okay? Predator prey. All right. Herbivory is usually negative for the plant, okay? Usually negative for the plant, but plants have adapted to this in some ways where animals that eat their fruits will eat them and seeds will be spread by the animal's waste. So there are some types that are positive, positive, but a lot of them are positive, negative, because some of these um, herbivores can really, really damage the plants to the point where the plant dies, or the point where the plant doesn't have enough energy to flower, make seeds, reproduce. Pretty easy one. All right. Symbiosis comes in multiple types. Okay, so let's talk about some of the types. Um, one thing about symbiosis is it always has at least one plus in it. Okay, so the first type is parasitism. That's where one thing is a parasite on another. Okay, you can think of anything from a tick to a leech to there's all sorts of internal parasites. Um, 
tapeworms and so on. Don't always think of parasites as completely like animal animal. Um, can you get a fungus on your body? That's a parasite. All right, mutualism is a positive positive, okay? You see this with uh, birds that hang out on the backs of animals and eat the insects that bother them. The animal has the insects, usually they're biting insects or a a insects that are trying to reproduce. They're, they're usually some sort of parasite, okay? And so by chasing away or eating as many of those insects as possible, everybody wins, except the insects. Commensalism, that's where some one guy, one, one species benefits, and the other one doesn't really care. Okay, the clownfish hanging out next to the poisonous uh, anemone is a very good example of this. Nothing really happens to the anemone, but the clownfish gains the protection of the poisonous uh, anemone. Finding Nemo stuff, right? All right, so know these different relationships, know um, these patterns of pluses and minuses. They're, they're, they're really kind of common sense. You know, if you have a parasite, you know, mutual, if we have a mutual agreement, we both get something out of it. Um, commensalism might be the harder one to memorize, but it's not, you know, it's not that bad. Okay, facilitation is one you probably haven't heard of, okay? This one is way more indirect. It's usually in the plant world, okay? It can be positive positive or zero positive. One species has some sort of positive effect on the other without a very close intimate relationship. All those other ones, things were right next door to each other. If you're a parasite, you're touching. You're on. You're literally. If you're um, um, mutualism, very very close. Okay. Uh, commensalism, very very close. Um, with plants, a lot of times one plant will improve the soil. There are certain plants that will host bacteria that add nitrogen to the the soil so it makes the area better for other plants as well There's certain rainforest plants that grow on other plants. Oh, that wouldn't be facilitation because they're touching. The big deal with facilitation is they don't have that intimate, close relationship. They may, they may grow at a different time. Okay. So those are your interspecific relationships, guys. How different species interact within a ecological community. All right, so new topic, species diversity, okay? What would the species diversity of a cornfield be? Pretty low, just corn, okay? And there's probably some weeds and insects in there, but the main species out there is corn. Compare that to just a meadow, an untended meadow. Different grasses, different flowers, lots of insects, no weed control.
probably much higher diversity. Okay, so let's take a look at this. There are two terms you want to talk about when you're talking about diversity. Richness. That's the number of different species. And then relative abundance. Okay? Relative abundance. Now this is not very hard, and it, and and these these can be important in different ways. Usually, the more rich an environment is, the more resilient it is. Okay, if there's only one species that lives there, it can really collapse. If that one, if 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 there's only like three species that live there, the whole thing can collapse if one of them is susceptible to something. And if we were saying that freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors were different species, which one, which one would that be? Richness or abundance? If I said that freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors were all different species, I'd be referring to richness or abundance there. Which one would I be talking about? Richness, okay? If I said that at the prom there's mostly seniors, then I'd be talking about abundance, okay? In a ecosystem, the greater the bio diversity the more resilient it is and usually the more productive it is there are more ways to get energy out of the out, out of the space if there are more biodiversities biodiversity in that space just remember that both these abundance and richness are components of biodiversity okay they are components okay which one of these um, has the highest richness? Same richness, okay? There's different, we don't really say like abundance, uh, uh, there's different abundances, okay? There are different abundances, that's all we can say. Okay. Both have the same richness, but that they have different abundance okay there is a formula for species diversity I might do a simulated lab with you if it doesn't snow tomorrow where we go outside and or next week it's supposed to snow this week um, we might do the diversity of the parking lot, okay, where we would count all the cars out there that are Ford would be one species. Then you go all the Chevys are one species, and we can get the diversity of the parking lot, okay. So we might do that lab, it'll get us outside, we'll do a little math, it's fun. So here's the formula you're going to use, okay. Got, it has that sigma notation in it, so what you would do, okay, this is called Simpson's Diversity Index. It is on your AP Bio formula sheet that you're going to be allowed to use on the test. These rarely come up on the test. They might just ask you questions about the richness and abundance, okay, which one has more richness, and they might talk about the difference abundance, okay. So this formula has two letter N's in it, which makes it a little confusing, but guess what? They tell you which one is which on the formula sheet. So if there are 500 cars in the parking lot, that number will always be the same for every time you use the formula, okay? If there are 100 Chevys in the parking lot, you would take 100, divide it by 500, square it. Then you would do the same thing for the next species. 
Let's say it's going to be Fords and there are 50. So you would take 50 divided by 500, square it, and add up all of these um, individual values, subtract it from one, and that will give you your diversity index. So we could go out and we could say the teacher parking lot has this diversity, the student parking lot has this diversity. And we could see which one was more diverse. Using the parking lot example is a quick and easy way to teach students how to do that because you go out to the environment you're like let's do it with trees you have to be an expert at tree identification okay if you use cars it's usually like written right on the bumper okay so we're not even going to really do any practice with that formula now there are um let me uh jump out of here for just a second and I'm going to add a slide. It's a pretty famous type of picture here. Ooh, that didn't work. Let's try it this way. Give me one second, everybody. Oh, that's not working either. Trying to drag a picture from Google Docs or Google Image Search and it doesn't like it. Plus, while you're recording, it tends to slow everything down. I'm, that's what I'm doing. All right. Shouldn't edit your lecture in the middle of your lecture, but I am. Okay. So, one of the big problems in a very interconnected world is invasive species, okay? Invasive species are organisms that are outside of their natural habitat. An example of one that everybody in Ohio knows about are stink bugs. Okay. Stink. Go ahead. Um, I think they're. I think. I don't think they're invasive. I just think we move firewood around so much that we help it more than. Okay. I'd have to see if it's actually invasive. But. Um, so invasive species become established outside of their native ecosystem almost always by human activity, okay? Um, I remember when I was in the Navy, I was unloading a bunch of supplies and there was a scorpion inside of them, okay? And that scorpion probably crawled in there in a warehouse, it's native environment, and it got transported to Hawaii. Now, Hawaii is a very delicate ecosystem now, there was only one, but if a collection of them or a pregnant one got transferred, it could cause a lot of ecological problems. Um, so, lots of different ways this can happen. Um, shipping, um, uh, produce. Um, there's lots of places that don't like you to bring produce in, 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 into there because you could bring agricultural diseases or invasive species. Another big one in Ohio are zebra mussels. They grow in Ohio waterways and, the, and, and they can plug up um, a lot of, uh, uh, thank you, a lot of um, uh, drains and pipes that lead into rivers power plants have a lot of tr 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 trouble with them one of the things these can do is they don't have any natural predators okay and they can overwhelm the native um ecosystem very very quickly
okay? We talked about stink bugs. They like it where it's warm, so they'll crawl in the house and they're kind of annoying. But some of them can be way more than just annoying, okay? This is a plant called kudzu, okay? Kudzu is a vine that can grow over just about anything and outcompete the local plants for sunlight and just absolutely overwhelm the local uh, plant life. It's, it's a, um, it grows super, super fast, okay? Um, it started in the south and it's spreading across the United States quite a bit. There are, there's lots of efforts to control it, but uh, it can literally kill the natural uh, uh, plant life in an area by just absolutely overwhelming it, okay? Uh, this is native to East Asia and a couple islands in the Pacific, but it's really, really, really outcompeting some areas of our country. Um, and, it, you know, it was transported here, I'm sure, accidentally. A lot of invasive species are brought in on purpose. Um, in Australia, they were growing sugar cane and they wanted something to uh, eat one of the um, pests that was on the sugar cane. And the toads multiplied like crazy. And they've totally, um, they're, they're, there's so many of them that they eat all the prey of the natural um, um, wildlife in the area. And so they, a lot of these will just totally explode. I think there was an episode of The Simpsons about that toad in Australia. Um, all right. So any intentional, like the cane toads, or unintentional, like the kudzu, um, anything that accident, anything that either intentionally or accidentally introduces an invasive species can take over or exploit a new niche, okay? Growing vines up a tree is a niche, okay? If trees evolved in an area where there were no vining plants, they have no defense, they have no way to deal with that new um, competitor for that resource and you can see what can happen. They kill the trees. And the bad thing is, it's not like the emerald ash borer where it's like it kills ash trees. It kills all of them pretty much, okay? So we, have, we would have to have something that wanted to eat kudzu to take care of that. Okay, so what we see is what was in this graph below here, okay? Um, invaders that can survive push down species diversity, okay? So we can have very delicate or even non-delicate relationships completely upset by invasive species. If you think about, like, between, now, between your breakfast and now, how many things did you use that were manufactured in other countries? A lot. So all the shipping in the world is very good at moving these things around. And that includes things like diseases. If you study history, when did this, what, what happened when uh, the uh, explorers came to the New World? What else did they bring with them? Diseases. Sexually transmitted diseases, smallpox, the native populations, the native human populations had no resistance to these diseases and they really suffered a lot. All right. Let's talk about keystone species, okay? Not all species in an environment are created equal, okay? Some of them have a very key, pivotal role and when they go down, it really drags the rest of the species down with them. They don't have to be abundant, but their presence in an ecosystem is relied upon by many, many other species, okay? Some examples, okay? 
coral reefs. Okay, one of the coolest things I got to do when I went to Australia is swim the Great Barrier Reef. It's like an explosion of color, life, and diversity. Lots and lots of things have an interplay. What's happening to coral reefs right now? They're getting bleached. They're basically dying, okay? Um, and all those other species that depend upon them absolutely disappear, okay? Now, one thing about coral is coral is actually many diverse species, but as a group, all corals are under attack by bleaching. And they're just dying. So, so probably the most diverse area of life on the planet are coral reefs, okay? Honeybees are one species, and they are pollinators for all sorts of natural and agricultural um, products. If you pay attention, there are trucks full of beehives that drive around and they take them from crop to crop to crop, but there's also natural pollinators out there too, okay? If a couple weeks ago I asked you a bonus question, what, how would you create the most chaos by making one species go extinct? Many of you picked keystone species, okay? Honeybees. Without that pollination, human agriculture and even non-human activities, non-human species, non-human cultivated species, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to get that out, would, would really, really suffer. There are secondary pollinators, but honeybees are sort of the workhorse that go out there and really get that done. We're discovering these keystone species are different for different environments and um, when they go down sometimes all sorts of unexpected things happen it turns out ecology is really 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 complex and there are relationships that we just don't have a good understanding of that once those things change it's oh oh i didn't realize these things had interdependence and we can quickly realize that ecosystems are more delicate than we thought they were. All right, thanks for sticking with me. I know this is a long one. We're, we're getting there. Okay. So, when we look at this as a whole, We've got keystone species, we've got producers and essential abiotic and biotic factors. All of these together cause huge changes when keystone species are removed. And we can get ecosystem collapse when the keystone species disappears. Visually, it's super easy to see with coral reefs. You see all this dead coral and like one or two fish swimming around. Then you see it before it happened and there's just fish of so many different species everywhere. Ecosystem collapse is starting to be like a real concern. You know, large ecosystems collapsing could have devastating consequences for all life on the planet. Scary stuff. All right. So, I'm leading up to disturbances. Okay, disturbances of, this is a, the last topic, I believe. Disturbances can have a big effect on diversity and composition, okay? So what, what is a disturbance, okay? A disturbance is any event, natural or human caused, 
That changes the community. Well, how's it going to change the community? It's either going to remove organisms, and it doesn't have to make them go all the way extinct. Okay? You don't have to kill all the bees for there to be an effect. Okay? Or it could be removing some resource. We talk about these people that burn down the rainforest, they grow a couple years of crops, they remove all the nutrients from the soil. So resources. You put a parking lot in, you're going to change the way rain runs off from the soil. All these little ponds you see around the neighborhood, say around the mall, around apartment complexes, out in front of the school, those ponds are not decorations. Those are to control storm water after you put a parking lot up. That water has to go somewhere. And those ponds slow it down. If it all just ran straight into the river, the people down river of us would get wiped out. Okay, the Scioto River would be overflowing up on the Riverside Drive. And those houses on Riverside would be floating down the stream. All right. So these disturbances could come in many, many, many forms. It could be building a dam on a river. It could be uh, climate change. It could be coming in and logging something. It could be, let's make a housing development. Let's make a parking lot. There's all sorts of disturbances. Everything you do causes some disturbance to the environment. Okay, so what happens with disturbances, okay? There's something called succession. Succession, okay? And succession is taking land that's kind of completely lifeless, okay? It kind of looks like the surface of the moon. And over many generations or years or whatever, we've colonized that. So one of the key things in that picture below, look how it goes from gray to brown. That's the creation of soil. Okay, I always think of dandelions. Have you ever noticed dandelions that like grow in the sidewalk or on a gravel pile or something like that? They're very good at this sort of level one or, or primary succession. And when the dandelions die, if you didn't go, don't go out and spray them with weed killer. They start building up soil. They can turn rock into soil. So if there's a volcano and everything's wiped out, that's sort of a natural way this could happen. There's a show on TV years and years ago called Life After Humans, and they were like, what would happen if all humans just disappeared? And it talked about like how quickly things like roads would break down and get over, overgrown with plants. And that, this, this topic always makes me think of that show. A show like downtown Manhattan covered in vines and things like that. And... All right. So here's, here's an example. Okay, we start with this happy little, looks like something you draw in kindergarten, but oh no, there's a fire. So the whole forest burns down, the fire goes out, and we just have bare dirt that's su secondary succession, okay? Why is it secondary? Because there's soil still left. So go back to the first one. You gotta create soil. Creating soil, soil is a very, 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 very valuable resource. We, we kind of like think of it as dirt. Dirt is like what you scrape out from under your fingernail. Soil is what you grow plants in, okay? So when the soil's left, when the soil is left, things can come back rather quickly, okay? So, here's a practice problem. Just in your mind, identify two changes in abiotic conditions that would lead to the succession scene. Like, what could cause this? I gave you one already, like a volcano going off, okay? Um, a landslide, okay? Um...
Huh? A flood can wipe out soil. You ever seen rivers like just tearing up the, the side of the, the bank of the river? So that, yeah, that could be one. Okay. We're almost there. So, in today's world, human activity is the strongest disturbance to ecosystems. Okay? And that leads to these, these three main threats here habitat loss okay we're just going out and building things or farming things and that removes habitat okay a lot of times when we think about these we're like yeah we need to stop doing that but i really like cereal okay so i like bread it's very hard to kind of say like hey stop destroying the habitat but i i still want to eat okay we talked about invasive species they can come in and just wipe out biodiversity. Over harvesting, okay? We can go out and if something becomes very desired by humans, we'll just go out and kill them all. What big African animals have that been happening to? Rhinos, okay? There's some native uh, beliefs about rhino horns being very potent medicines. And if you don't have any money and someone's willing to pay you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars or thousands of times what you could make in a year, going out and killing that rhino starts to look really good. And then, of course, global changes due to um, burning fossil fuels. But there's other global changes as well. What's the big deal with the ocean right now? The big what? Plastics. Okay? Right now, there's so much plastic in the environment that you eat, you know, like the little square Lego blocks? I read that every human on the planet, there's so much plastic now that we're eating a Lego block worth of plastic a month or a year. I can't remember what the time frame was, but we're, we, everything you eat has plastic in it now. What's that going to do to you when it can cross? When the plastic gets ground down fine enough by moving through the environment, what's it going to do when it can enter your cells? We're not there yet, but wow. Yeah, you're going to turn it into a Lego? Um, does anybody remember when you could go to Bath, Bed Bath, uh, uh, Bath and Body Works and buy soap with little... Uh, pellets in it that would like scrub your skin Does anybody yeah. where were all those going down the drain and into the environment okay they outlawed those they were plastic we were just like yeah let's put plastic and soap to, to scrub our skin with they've replaced a lot of exfoliating beads with uh, plant particles but at one time, they started putting plastic in, in liquid soap. And when you wash your hands, you would feel that rough stuff go across your hands. And it was like, ah, I'm exfoliating. It feels good. It would all go down the drain. There's no real good way in our, in our, in our wastewater system to recover that. And it's, it's ending up out in the environment. So when you look at these plastic garbage patches out in the ocean, they're bad. But when it's getting ground down so fine that it's entering the food system, we, we don't even know what it's going to do. I mean, scary stuff. All right. So one of the biggest threats is habitat loss, and that's when we use land for agriculture or urban development. Ohio used to be, they used to say Ohio had enough trees that if you were a squirrel, you could cross the whole state without touching the ground. Almost all the trees in Ohio are, are not original. There's one or two little spots of original old growth forest, and it looks so much different than like what we see out there. You walk under these trees, and the trees are very, very far apart. Um, There's lots of decay down in the forest to return nutrients to the ground because they just don't go in and harvest the wood in those 
virgin forest. Now, there's responsible ways to grow timber, okay? Where you go out and just harvest the trees that are... But a lot of this is clear-cutting. The early pioneers to Ohio, they didn't have chainsaws, so they just go out and cut a ring around the tree and wait for it to die. And a lot of people believe when they first colonized Ohio that farm, uh, farm crops wouldn't grow unless there were trees there. And that wasn't exactly true. If you go out to the Great Plains state, see there weren't trees and things still can grow. But a lot of beliefs at the time influenced how we got to where we are today. So when you look out the window and you see a forest, it's not really like natural. I mean, it is natural because it grew back through succession, but the natural state of Ohio was much, much different than the forest we see today. Uh, we talked about the invasive species. Um, what's going on here in this picture? It's fishing. Okay, we can over harvest things faster they, than they can rebound. Um, before we had plastic, ivory was sort of a, a plastic substitute and sort of a status symbol. So ivory is now, uh, the trade of ivory is now banned, okay? Piano keys used to be made out of ivory. Those are just examples, guys, but it can be, it can be anything, okay? You can over-harvest anything. And of course, let's break down global change. There's lots of these. Just the amount of, I'm gonna just very generically call pollution because there's so many different kinds. It's, you know, that's a whole course right there. One of the really, really big ones is CO2 emission. We're taking all these fossil fuels, burning them, putting CO2 into the air, CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere are higher than I think they've ever been in the history of the planet. And it's starting to have real effects. Ocean acidif acidification is due to a lot of the fertilizers we use. There are places on Earth where there used to be bodies of water that are just disappearing. The tundra in Russia is thawing out, okay, and causing these giant sinkholes to form because the ice held the soil up, and so now it's just collapsing. A lot of change is natural, but we're accelerating it to a rate that the planet's never seen before. So you'll get people that say, well, there's always been changes. It's the rate. This will lead to big changes in ecological systems. It's just unavoidable. Okay. Right now, we have huge numbers of endangered species. And we're a little bit worried that a lot of the species that are threatened could p potentially be food crops. Maybe they have medicinal properties that we haven't learned about yet. Okay. Plants provide fibers. You guys know what you do with fibers, right? It's what you make your cotton clothes out of. There are other fibers besides cotton. Cotton is one of the most fertilizer intense crops out there. And scientists believe we're in the sixth major mass extinction. And a lot of times we'll concentrate on the big cute animals, but we're also making little things go extinct too that nobody notices. And they don't notice them, but they might notice the effect they have in the environment. Okay. I, I'm getting there. I'm sorry. I know this is a long one. Stick with me. 
It is the last lesson of the whole course. Okay, there are other really large scale factors that contribute to diversity. Latitude. Latitude means you're closer to the equator versus the poles. Where do we see the most diversity? Closer to the tropics. There's more energy input. And then you just go to area. Larger areas are more diverse. They just have more habitats, okay? If you're on a tiny little island, the diversity might be very small. If you're on a continent, there's all sorts of different habitats. Now, the good news is there are things we can do to slow this down and reverse it. The bad news is we're not interested in doing it. But I think that's changing as newer generations arise and see the importance of it. I think your generation has it pretty tough. You've got economic problems, you've got social justice problems, you've got environmental problems, like your guys, you guys are carrying the problems of generations upon generations of bad moves. All right, other things that cause problems, and we learned a lot about that this year, are pathogens, okay? Disease causing organisms and viruses, okay? They can have a huge effect on things that don't have a lot of biodiversity. If there's not much biodiversity and you come in and a disease hits a species, it can be bad. Honeybees for a while had um, a pathogens carried by mites. And a lot of things, pesticides, the mites, have hit bees all at once and bees, are, numbers of bees are really going down. Guys, for the rest of your life, if a swarm of bees ever lands in your front yard, please do not call an exterminator. Call a beekeeper and they'll come take them and be happy, okay? A lot of people go out there and like, I'm gonna spray these guys with raid, they're gonna kill me. Swarming bees don't really hurt anyone because they have nothing to defend. Okay, and they're dividing. That's they're, you're you're killing the reproduction of a bee uh, of a bee colony. Okay, I'm gonna skip this FRQ. We are done with this class. So, I'm not the only one that's gonna clap. All right, I guess I'm the only one that's gonna clap. All right, thank you. Just think about how much you've learned. We've got the exam coming up. We're gonna start reviewing for the exam. You got your chapter eight test coming up. Congratulations for getting through this with me during the hardest school year in the history of modern education. We did it. I think we're gonna do it Friday, but maybe Monday, because I might do those labs, depending on what the outside weather looks like. 